Hi, uh, great to be here. I'm David. I'm one of the partners at Boldeton. Uh, for those that don't know, Boldeton is kind of a European investment firm. Uh, the headquarters is in London. We have people across Europe. Uh, we invest in the best tech entrepreneur coming from Europe. Um, I've been around for 24 years. We have invested in like more than 200 entrepreneurs. And one of them is Matt at Photoroom. We've been working with him like for the last two years. So very excited like to, to have a quick chat with you, Matt. Hey. Uh, Hi, everyone. Excellent. Uh, so maybe uh, as a start, why don't you walk us through kind of what was the initial story behind Photoroom? Yeah, so um, Photoroom is five years old. Um, and maybe to reframe it, like what we do at Photoroom, our mission is to give the power of great imagery to everyone, especially entrepreneurs using AI from like small, very small side hustle to like the biggest company um, like Amazon uh, using our technology. And well, the initial story, the initial story you ask is, is like, I've been working in the field of photo image editing for the past 15 years. And what happened is I, I happened to be, I think, seven years ago in a startup that was acquired by, by GoPro. And I was, um, yeah, post acquisition, uh, sitting, managing uh, photo video editing apps, sitting in the office of the startup. And uh, I needed to do marketing assets. Um, okay. So, I mean, I don't know who develops like uh, mobile apps, but uh, sometimes you, you get lucky, you get featured by uh, Apple, and uh, you need to provide like assets for the following day if it's not yesterday. And well, I look at my designer, and my designer is on holiday, and uh, GoPro is sleeping in San Francisco. So I just like open like uh, a famous editing software. Uh, but, uh, Photoshop has like 2,000 buttons, and I just spent the afternoon trying to understand and get back into it. And just it's a super frustrating experience. And so there, and on my side, there was an AI researcher, and I saw all the stuff that were coming on AI. So it was seven years ago, and this didn't make sense. Like, there are a lot of people doing visual, or they're not doing that every day. And how do we make that more accessible? It must, be so, it must not be the only one having this problem, you know? So that's, that's the inception. Like that's the, how it started. Excellent. I mean, you have an amazing number of users. Uh, do, do you want to tell us, like, I mean, maybe a quick number of stats about like how many people use Photoroom today, and and maybe like one one anecdote about like a pivotal moment about what significantly impacted like the growth of the company, because you have had like yeah. amazing growth. Yeah. Yeah. So Photoroom uh, is one of the biggest AI photo editor, uh, all platform iOS, Android, and we have 200 millions, 200 million downloads. So indeed, quite big. All like all 180 countries, 30 languages. Uh, people use us from the U.S. to South Africa to Australia and Japan. Very, very international from day one. And yeah, I think what we did in the beginning, like as a pivotal moment that was very important and can be interesting for founders, is we we started doing like photo plus video using AI. I remember we started in uh, summer 2019 doing photo plus video, and then you say, like, it's, we can't do everything. Like, we, we need to do a bit less. We'll do video later. Let's drop video. Let's only do photo. And so that's like, and two months later, I remember with Elliot, my co-founder, we say, OK, we can't do everywhere, everywhere, <laughs> everything on photo. Let's do what works. Let's focus on commerce photo, because we see like there is more interaction and uh, very interesting feedback. So let's focus 10x, because actually 10% of users doing photo do that for commerce. Mm -hmm. And maybe we have 10x less user, but let's do it well. And so we focused 10x on commerce photo. And that's like beginning of 2020. And then we hit product market fit. So focus, focus. And then like, you focus 10x, and you grow 10x. Amazing, amazing. Did you, I mean, how did you, uh, I know you have a very um, unique way to work like, uh, and to ingest like, user feedback. Yep. You want to tell us more about? How you, you collect that, how do you use it, and how it influences like, how you build the product? Right. So, I mean, Photoroom is a bit special in the AI space because we're not a lab. We come from the open source and then get user feedback. And f user feedback was key in Photoroom history. And what we would do with Elliot is we would, like, we had a, an office just in the block of a McDonald's and at lunch, 
we'd go down, go in the McDonald line uh, queue, and ask people like, if you do you want to test our app or photo app, people are curious, and we pay for your meal. And so we just like people were happy about it, and they gave us like tremendous amount of feedback, and. They also tried the app, and so every time, like we had this new feature, and no one would get to this feature, so it got us to iterate, mm -hmm. remove the little friction, so and understand the like inception, like what we say is like show don't tell in product design. So you want to show the feature and understand how people would use it, and we did that. I actually we did that so much that I got banned from the McDonald. I couldn't <laughs> go anymore. So yeah, you have, I mean, if you don't get to that point, I guess you're not talking to your user enough related to what uh, Justin can say. <laughs> And that was like uh, the key to understanding this commerce focus that was interesting and really get valuable feedback from our users. Excellent. How, how did you go about monetizing early days? Right. So I think one thing we did extremely well on that side, and we, I mean, it wasn't obvious at that point, is we, from first day of code to shipping, it was two weeks for the app. And in the first version of the app, uh, we shipped Photo Room with subscription. Mm -hmm. And that, like, uh, we were totally ashamed of the product. Like, uh, I really felt, I feel again the, 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 the shame of like, shipping and asking people to pay for that. But actually, some people used it. And uh, when you have people paying for it, like, that give you, will give you feedback. And the feedback from people paying is actually much more valuable to build on top than the feedback of free users. Because you know, like the, well, if you have people who pay that give you feedback, it might mean, especially for like, a very a product you're ashamed of, like probably there is 10x, 100x, 1 million x more people that can use your product if you do it well. Yeah. And so like putting subscription from day zero in the App Store was like a, the biggest, like a very good move for monetization. Plus if you do uh, paid acquisition, like mm -hmm. you can get a payback that, well, you don't need to raise that much from VCs. Uh, oh sorry oh. about that. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that maybe. But it's kind of refreshing, no? Because a lot of people hesitate, in fact, in putting like monetization into the product from day one. Yeah, so it's good to hear like it's totally possible, and in fact, you, you saw a lot of benefit from that. Yeah, yeah, amazing benefit, and you filter the feedback from paying user to non-feedback paying user, and that's like the best source of what should I build next, you know, and what should I improve. No, that's quite good. So you started the product like for for B two C, like you explained, like people in, a, in yeah, uh, you know, in McDonald. Uh, and then you move to B2B. So do you want to explain us like why, why you decided like to, to go from B2C to B2B, how you extended to that market? Right. So I, I think, I mean, it's a great question here. And I think the first point is like, well, just after getting like successful product market fit with eBay seller, what made sense for us, and that's our like monetization philosophy is you should pay for Photoroom if you're making money selling out there. So, well, that means like it's, it's kind of a business that is selling. And so from day one, like monetization, the pro plan was for prosumers, so people making money. And quite quickly, and the adjacent like, market for that is, well, it's the people that are like, well, maybe not one person, but like two plus people, what we call B2B, like from like two people to one million people, you know? <laughs> and so it made sense that the adjacent move would be, okay, let's go to, to B2B. And that was because we really had this pull from our users that wanted to have a a good, a good like a B2B product. And we had people, I think the most important signal for us was there was a strong pull from our users and to, uh, to build this app for multiple people. And then when we ask them like, and dig into that and talk to user again, like from what I just said about McDonald, they told mm -hmm. us, they described the experience they had like using photos for their product and it made no sense. You had like, people were sending like, uh, you should 50 images, they were sending text emails to like, the other people in the warehouse on eBay. What? Like we're in 20, uh, back in 2021, 20, 2022, 20, you do have to send like test message to send a photo to someone else in your team. That, I mean, an email don't support more than two photos. Doesn't make any sense. So we sense the, like, the need for that. And the second part was like actually asking our users. I remember um, Ash K from Notion, he told us uh, like, well, I mean, I know you have people, but do you really have that many people that are interested by that? And so what we did is in the onboarding of the app, we asked, like, are you actually interested by a team product? Okay. And the stats were actually very impressive. So we, well, let's go in. Like, let's go all in on that and build the foundation for a multiplayer product that works. So. Amazing. Did you, did you change the product? Is it the same product for B2C, for B2B? Did you have to kind of adapt what you, you are doing? Or? 
Yeah, so the, I mean, the main, like, the main stack, the AI, is similar. Actually, the AI got better because of B2B, because they are a bit more demanding, uh, I think, on the quality. Okay. So they give us feedback, and then we can improve the AI model. That is the one that we train, the foundation model, that is good for everyone. And so it gets us better. The, big, the two big things we did for B2B uh, are like, uh, two big tech investments. The first one is multiplayer. So we, we build a stack that works on iOS, Android, web and API, so the same AI, same rendering engine that's uh, everywhere for a commerce photo, and you can collaborate on it. So yeah, you have to build like, this multiplayer stack that everyone can use as a team and edit together. Uh, we have to change a bit the monetization so you can have like, multiple seats mm -hmm. uh, in your team. And for bigger companies, like we serve um, you know, DoorDash, World, Amazon, they use our API. So then we, well, we had the tech, but we built the API endpoint, the, well, the, the new interface, so that you can edit millions of photos if you have a big catalog, instead of like 50 photos for a small e-commerce, like a small reseller. This is quite amazing. How, how did you get to work with those like, large enterprises? I mean, did they find yeah. you, or did, did you go after them? Or? Yeah, because it's very different than finding users like um, you know, it, B2C it, segment. Yeah? yeah, it is different. Um, well, I think, again, like uh, coming to they come, came to us, okay. and there are so many stories. So we, I mean, it's great to be here in Helsinki because one of the biggest like uh, success story of the B2B for us is like helping uh, Walt doing uh, millions of images for the dishes in 25 countries in the world. Like they have hundreds of people using Photoroom together, and they are like using the API now to automate this uh, photo editing process. So it's like uh, well. Helsinki is kind of part of photography story, you know? <laughs> and they, the story is like Jeff is the director of uh, photography uh, at uh, World. He mm -hmm. was at Amazon before and he just, I remember he messaged me on my birthday, I think two years ago, and he told me like, Matt, uh, I tried your app, it's great, but uh, I mean, I have like hundreds of people, can you help me with that? And so what we've seen so far is the people from, yeah, the people using the app, they, they can be become B2B. The uh -huh. challenge for a photo with two, uh, an app with 200 million users is, well, how do you make the difference between, well, uh, a teenager, I don't know, uh, in London doing like memes and Jeff, who like is a potential like 100 seats uh, customer. And that's, that's a real challenge. But uh, so we went with Jeff, we built some elements for, for the world team. And now they have like uh, hundreds of editors. They do more like, uh, they do millions of photos with us. They save hours of work and they can launch New countries, branded photos, very fast, uh, thanks to Photoroom Tech. Excellent. Well, that's a great story. Uh, so you mentioned AI, so we should probably talk about AI. Uh, so you made the decision of kind of creating your own proprietary AI model. Um, I mean, you started using off-the-shelf, like other models, etc., and then you, you decided to move to your own model. Do you want us to walk through kind of, yeah, uh, explain like how you made that decision, how did you go about it? Yeah. Uh, so. We started, like, we, I mean, the story is that we started from my, like my pain point, you know, and I wanted to build stuff, and we try always, like, talking to users, start from the user pain point. And I remember, so we did Y Combinator in 2020, and I remember Gustav, our partner, he told us, like, for the pitch, you, you know, Matt, like, you have to highlight that you're not a lab doing AI and then trying to push the tech to some use case you don't know yet, you're, which is great. Like, I mean, we're here with ChatGPT because of that, but Photom is a bit different. Because you, you do useful AI. So you start from like a user pain point, and then you develop it, and you, like, you save time. You make people make more sales with your tech for commerce photography. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's a different approach, and you have to highlight like that. And so our, our strategy is quite, quite unique on that is, well, let's, let's, let's take like, three, three steps. Like, let's take what's off the shelf. Let's take what open, what's open source. And, and uh, first, let's, let's like, give this tech to our user and see what, what they, they like, what they don't like, how they are, are they happy about it. And, um, and so that's our first step is like doing, using the off-the-shelf open source tech for our product. Second part is, well, usually people like, with some iteration, they understand it, we understand the value, and, but they tell us like, okay, it's great, that's a use case, but it's not quite there yet in terms of quality, in terms of speed, Instead of in, in terms of the data set, is not on the commerce photography, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so we we listen to that, and then we say, okay, but that that part we, I mean, we can't really have it with the open source or off the shelf model because it's so generalized. And Photoroom is like focused on this 
like niche of photography, which is billion of users, but still. And so we would train a model specifically for that. And so what we do there is we, well, we do that for segmentation. So we do background removal, for instance. We're the best at it. And so we would train our own segmentation model that is now like two x better than anyone like in the world because we we really like understand what it means. Like for our user, not being 100% perfect on segmentation means they're going to spend hours doing the cutout of the photo manually, <laughs> where well, you don't see that when you do a science benchmark. Like for us, it's hours of uh, time of our entrepreneurs using Photoroom that is lost because the tech is not there. So we get the extra step, the extra mile for that. And that's when we decide to train our own model. That's the segmentation thing. The Gen AI model, so we also trained one model. And it was this model, it's the same similar story. So we, we try like open source, and then we come to our user. And well, it's too slow. It doesn't work really well for our use case of like creating a scene for your product, and uh, it's not really like aesthetic the way we want. And the data set like is not good. Like uh, uh, you, I don't have the, I don't know which data I choose to train. Yeah. And so we choose the data that is that makes sense for B two B for that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure like B two B customers don't want to kind of you know, surface image of their competitors yeah, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. I mean, building your own model is like sounds like incredibly complicated. So you know, do you want to share like some insight about how you went about it? Is like, is it? Did you find it easy? Or? <laughs> no, it's uh, not easy. It took it took like close to a year to to develop it, and we're building a bigger one, a uh, bigger one right now. Uh, it takes a few iterations. You need to build the stack, the team, more importantly. Last year, like GPUs, uh, one of the features we do is like amazing shadows. We couldn't release it because we didn't have GPUs. Yeah. So it takes like, you have these three ingredients of talent, stack, and data that you have to run together and make sure it makes the right. Uh, Recipe, mm -hmm. and then so that's the training part, and that's like that's extremely difficult. You need the uh, yeah, it takes a long uh, long time, and that's just halfway. Uh, the second part is like launching it, and that's like that's a story like we don't talk too much about, but actually launching a model of a feature when you already had one other version of it is super difficult because people. I mean, you can see AI as like your coworker that you would have and work close to. And if overnight you're updating the model you're launching, like it's like if you switch the coworker you have like just sitting next to you, change the character, the personality, user get upset. Like they, yeah, like they don't they, recognize what they had. Yeah, they. The previous what, day, yeah. Is it the same person? Like, am I, am I working today with the same like uh, person? And the truth is, it's not really. <laughs> so you have to like take into account kind of the personality. Maybe a good way to see it is like the you know the her movie her movie yeah like you change the girlfriend overnight like people will get upset like when you do that like massive update so you have to A/B test you have to go back to the cooking uh, cooking your model aligning your model making sure it's better in some use cases so it takes months to to release that and so that was like a big learning and I I think we'll see more and more companies talking about how do you release a model because it's not an easy task. It's uh, not, I mean, as complicated as the first part of training it. Excellent. I mean, so you created your own model, but I mean, you have many models out there. You have companies that invest like billions into their own model, like OpenAI, for example. So yeah. How do you ensure your model is like competitive or better, like for your use case than kind of generic model out there? Or? Yeah, I think, I mean, for founders, it's important to recognize like we're going into a multi yeah. uh time and we, I mean, in Photoroom we use images model that we train, but we also use like uh, LLMs to re recommend the best like uh, images you get. So yeah. I think it's important to start from like uh, 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 the starting point is I will not train all my models and we'll get sound, video, images, and that's that's our approach. Like we won't train everything. So like be conscious about what you want to train, and our our conscious decision is we only train things where we think we can be in the the best in the world on it. And so we don't do like a text to text, uh, text to image. We don't do it yet. And what we do is like background removal, best in the world, and we train for that. Like uh, AI background, so creating a, a scene from a product photography, like we're the best and fastest in the world for that. And so here, well, we make sure that it's a very, it's an application that we have the data yeah. for that. We have a community of uh, 30 million active users that give us feedback uh, when we release. And so that's no something no one else has. So. We have the data to train the model, align it, and make the result that we know is the best, and other people won't know because it's too generalist on that side. But the open source model out there, like keep advancing, people keep innovating, etc. So you, yep. how, how do you be sure, like you, you leverage like the latest science in some way or the latest kind of advancement? 
Yeah, I mean, open source is like a key part of like, uh, Photomo wouldn't be here if we didn't have open source and we contribute regularly. What's important when you do AI is rebranching, if you take the developer analogy, so you have the main trunk and then you want to rebranch like every six months, three months, 12 months mm -hmm. to make sure you incorporate all the like uh, latest science in your model because the biggest risk is you go like, well, you build your branch that is like so long, so heavy that, well, Heavy branches, they just like break. So you, you, have to, you, you want to stay close and rebranch every, like, every six months. The trick is knowing when to rebranch, and that's, like, that's more an art than a science. But uh, yeah, it's uh, like keeping close and contributing to open source. Uh, we actually like, made our first open source contribution like, in the past month. Okay. It's really key uh, to being a state of the art. Excellent. How, do, you, do you have like, any metrics you use like, to? to be sure your model is better than others? Like how do you benchmark your model versus kind of what's available out there? Right. So it, 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 is, uh, it is, I think, something new in software. Yeah. Like uh, we know how to release deterministic code and there are like, tons of services for that. There are no like, a stack or tools to do that off the shelf today. So it's a real challenge for people doing AI in their applications. Mm -hmm. uh, what we look at is, and uh, we are one of the few companies doing that in AI, is we do A-B test our models and we look at activation around uh, image creation to make sure that what we do is better than what we had in the past. And so we would release, like, for instance, a new background removal uh, model, and we test it. We make sure conversion is higher. And once that, when, once that happens, we release it. So A-B test is the first part uh, using activation. And then the second part is like, well, we did that, for instance, I'll take an example. We did that for the segmentation. We released it. And then the problem is like it's a probabilistic model. So mm -hmm. you can't say it's better on every single dimension, every single photo you can take. Like maybe it's better for furniture, but it's not as good for cars, you know? And so what we did for the last release, for instance, is we released it and some part of the community got really upset. And the, the people were doing like dog photography and, uh, and it was a specific use case of dog photography that was Pet Shop Honor, which is a big uh, part of what we do. And they, well, they got upset because we are not keeping just the dog, but also the vet table on which the dog was, which didn't look very nice when you take like, uh, dog photos. You don't want like the me uh, medical table to stay. And so they give us, that's why the community we have of tens of thousands of users is super important. And what we got is like we took this data in uh, from the users and we were able to like retrain and fine tune this model on this specific very, like dimension. and release a new model like a, a few weeks later that was fixing that. And I think AI will go more into that. What you have to keep in mind is it's really like you have different segments and like it's probabilistic. So for you can't control everything. You don't have like QA tools for that now. And just listen to your users again. And if they're vocal about something, it's probably that right. <laughs> like the qualitative <laughs> data is, if the qualitative data is not agreeing with the quantitative data, like qualitative data is often right. And so you just like, uh, dig and dig and understand, OK, yeah, that's right. And then actually when we, we dug into the dog photos, yeah. well, the conversion was flat. And then you, and probably we don't have this data yet, but we separate like dog photo at home and in a vet uh, shop, then probably at home was good, but the other one wasn't. So build the data set for that. So it's a mix of like, so you, 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 it's a mix of like what you explained before. It's like a benchmark on one side, like to be sure your model is performing well, but also like ingesting kind of user feedback. Yeah? So yeah. how do you balance those, those two things? Yeah, I think I mean, it's kind of a, a, indeed like you, you have the right images, it's like a balance to find that you, because you want to keep moving, AI is not waiting for you. Yeah. So keep shipping, keep shipping. And I think what will go is more into something that is closer, looks like to me, like what was mobile apps 10 years ago. So like building, there was no like a, uh, continuous development stack. It was difficult to, to build that. And, you, you want to have like this like sh shipping cycles that maybe every week, every two weeks, take into account all this data and make it possible to ship and upgrade and iterate all the time. You want to have multiple models running at the same time, which is not easy because it takes a lot of GPU space yeah. and memory. So we'll get more into these like, uh, possibilities of testing and yeah, having a shipping cycle that makes sense for AI. Like you want to train faster and so you can iterate every week. I think that's what will happen in the future. Excellent, super. Uh, I mean, we are nearly on time, so maybe one last question is, do you have any advice, like, I mean, this is a funder stage, so there's like probably a bunch of funders in the room, uh, hopefully. <laughs> uh, do, do, do you have any advice for them about like somebody that would want to build their own AI model? 
Um, I, I do think like not everyone is going to build like foundation models. Uh, what does matter, whether you use foundation model or use uh, build them or use them or use the API, is is it good and which one is better? And that's actually opening the door for uh, after if you want to train one, train one. But I, I would say as like a, an entrepreneur, what you want to do is like, like play with it, build like an understanding of how it works, and kind of understanding if one, one works better than the other. I'll give you an example for like a language translation. It might be that some Western languages work better with this API, this model, but Asian, uh, Asian uh, languages work best with another model. And so it's kind of pulling the right services and building this understanding, this intuition, this, this stack of what model is better. Because once, if one day you decide to train your own model, that will be like knowing if your, better, your model is better than something else and testing it is actually super valuable and don't get your user upset because it's, it's less performing. So I think understanding which model is better is the key. Excellent. Cool. We're on time. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks, David. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks.